what are the different ways uh, the evolution of the exponential scaling of digital fabrication can evolve. So you said, uh, yeah, self-replicating nanobots, right? This is the, the gray goo fear. It's a caricature of a fear, but nevertheless, there's interesting, just like you said, spam and all these kinds of things that came with the scaling of communication and computation. What are the different ways that malevolent actors will use this technology. Yeah, today. well, first, let me start with a benevolent story, which yes. is uh, trash is an analog concept. Yeah. There's no trash in a forest. All the parts get disassembled and reused. Trash means something doesn't have enough information to tell you how to reuse it. Yeah. It's as simple as th there's no trash in a Lego room. When you assemble Lego, the Lego bricks have enough information to, to disassemble them. So one of the so as you go through this Fab one, two, three, four story, one of the implications of this transition to from printing to assembling. So the real breakthrough technologically isn't additive versus subtractive, which is a subject of a lot of attention and hype. Um, you know, 3D printers are useful. Um, you know, we spun off companies like Form Labs led by Max for 3D printing. But in a fab lab, it's one of maybe 10 machines. It's, it's used, but it's only part of the machines. Mm -hmm. The real technological change is when we go from printing and cutting to assembling uh, and disassembling. Mm -hmm. But that reduces inventories of hundreds of thousands of parts to just having a few parts to make almost anything. Mm -hmm. It reduces global supply chains to locally sourcing these building blocks. But one of the key implications is it gets rid of technological trash because you can disassemble and reuse the parts, not throw them away. And so initially that's of interest for things at the end of long supply chains, like satellites on orbit. But one of the things coming is eliminating technical trash through reuse of the building blocks. So like when you think about 3D printers, you're thinking about so addition and subtraction. When you think about the other options available to you in that parameter space, as you call it, yes. that's going to be assembly, disassembly, cutting, you said? So the 1952 NC mill was uh, subtractive. You remove material. Mm -hmm. And um, 3D printing additive, and there's a couple claims to the invention of 3D printing, that's closer to what's called net shape, which is you don't have to cut away the material you don't need, you just put material where you do need it. Mm -hmm. And so that's the 3D printing revolution. But there are all sorts of limitations on 3D printing to um, the kinds of materials you can print, um, the kind of functionality you can print. We're, we're, we're just not going to get to making a um, everything in a cell phone on a single printer. But I do expect to make everything in a cell phone with an assembler. And so instead of printing and cutting technologically, it's this transition to assembling and disassembling. You know, going back to Shannon and von Neumann, going back to the ribosome four billion years ago. Now, you, you come to malevolent. Um, let me tell you a story about, I was doing a briefing for the National Academy of Sciences group that advises the intelligence communities. And I talked about the kind of research we do. And at the very end, I showed a little video clip of Valentina in Ghana um, making a, a local girl making surface mount electronics in the Fab Lab. And I showed that to this room full of people. Uh, one of the in members of the intelligence community got up livid and said, how dare you waste our time showing us a young girl in an African village making surface mount electronics. We're looking at, we need to know about disruptive threats to the future of the United States. <laughs> and yeah. somebody else got up in the room and yelled at him and you idiot, I can't think of anything more important than this. Yeah. But for two reasons. One reason was um, because if we rely on like informational superiority in the battlefield, it means other people could get access to it. But this intelligence person's point, bless him, wasn't that. It was getting at the root causes of conflict, is if this young girl in an African village could actually master surface mount electronics, it changes some of the most fundamental things about recruitment for terrorism, um, uh, impact of economic migration, basic assumptions about an economy. It's just, just existential for the future of the planet. But, you know, we've just lived through a pandemic 
I would love to linger on this because the possibilities that are positive are endless. Yeah. But the possibilities that are negative are still nevertheless extremely important. Well, it's both positive and negative. What do you do with a large number of general assemblers? Yeah. With the fab lab, you could roughly make a bio lab, then learn biotechnology. Now that's terrifying because making self-reproducing gray goo that outcompetes biology, I consider doomed because biology knows everything I'm describing and is really good at what it does. Mm -hmm. um, in how to grow almost anything, you learn skills in biotechnology that would let that let you make serious biological threats. And when you combine uh, some of the innovations you see with large language models, some of the innovations you see with AlphaFold, so applications of AI for designing biological systems, for uh, writing programs, which you can with large language models increasingly. So there seems to be an interesting dance here of automating the design stage of complex systems using AI. And then that's the that, that's the bits. Mm -hmm. And you can leap, now the innovations you're talking about, you can leap from the complex systems in the digital space to the, the printing, to the creation, to the assembly uh, at scale of uh, complex systems in the physical space. Yeah, so something to be scared about mm -hmm. is a fab lab can make a bio lab, a bio lab can make biotechnology, somebody could learn to make a virus. Sure. Uh, that's scary. That that's uh, Unlike some of the things I said, I don't worry about, that's something I really worry about that is scary. Okay. Now, how do you deal with that? Uh, prior threats we dealt with command and control. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, you know, uh, early color copiers had unique codes and you could tell which copier made them. Eventually you couldn't keep up with that. Uh, there, there was a famous meeting at Asilomar in the early days of recombinant DNA mm -hmm. where that community recognized the dangers of what it was doing and put in place a regime to help manage it. And so that led to the kind of research management so you know, MIT has an office to, that supervises research and it works with the national office. That works if you can identify who's doing it and where. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work in this world we're describing. Yeah. So anybody could do this anywhere. And so what we found is you can't contain this. It's already out. You can't forbid because there isn't command and control. The most useful thing you can do is provide incentives for transparency. Yes. So, but really the heart of what we do is you could do this by yourself in a basement for nefarious reasons, or you could come into a place in the light where you get help and you get community and you get resources. Mm -hmm. And there's an incentive to do it in the open, not in the dark. And that might sound naive, but in the sort of places we're working, you know, um, again, bad people do bad things in these places already, but providing openness and providing transparency is a key part of managing these. And so it, it, it transitions from regulating risks as regulation to, to soft power to manage them. So there's so much potential for good, so much capacity for good that uh, fab labs and the, uh, the, the ability um, and the tools of creation really unlock that potential. Yeah, and I, I don't say that as sort of dewy-eyed naive. I, I say that empirically from just yeah. years of seeing how this plays out in communities. I, I wonder if it's the early days of personal computers, though, before we get spam, right? 